I suppose I've been called a bibliophile. I've been called a bibliomaniac. But uh, either way, it's just a reflection of my love for books. I can't remember when I didn't want books. And uh, I, I remember writing Santa Claus and asking for books. So uh, I, I have a collection that's uh, a collection of a lifetime. My daddy uh, liked books. We had a, a book shelf, bookcase in our living room. And uh, I was always exploring what he was. And then I knew uh, what my interests were and what I wanted. And so I, I asked for it. And, and uh, fortunately, well, we lived in the small town of Memphis, Texas, out of the Panhandle. And, and no, there's no bookstores around there, but there was a stationery shop in Amarillo, and mother and, and daddy would go up there occasionally for uh, shopping or for in connection with our bus their businesses, a flower shop. So they would bring home books from time to time, and I, I still have those books, but uh, I'm, I just. I'm crazy about books. When uh, I left the uh, Supreme Court, why well, President Clinton appointed me to the National Commission on Libraries and Information Science. Well, I remember Briar Rabbit and the Briar Patch. You know, that was exactly what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. So I appreciate the opportunity to have a broader field of interest as far as books are concerned. What was your early preference? Fiction? Non-fiction? No, non-fiction. History. History. History has been my concern always. And I, I guess what really got turned me on on history was the fact that Daddy would tell stories that of his father, who was in this, who was a Confederate soldier. and. Um, he, he would tell those stories. Well, that also was made me interested in Lincoln. Of course, Lincoln was, <laughs> was an anathema to Confederates, but, uh, but I was interested in the whole thing because, uh, well, I've just been fascinated by it. I have a, a picture uh, here in my office. It's uh, signed by my third grade teacher who's, who's says I was her favorite history student. So so it goes all the way back. So American history is your preference? Well, I like, I just like it all. And, and I get, I'm rather whimsical about that. I will have an interest in American history for a while and, and read a lot on that and then English history. I've done a lot of reading in English history. I like ancient history. Um, just I, if I read a book in, on a particular subject, then that fascinates me and I want to get on to other books on the same subject. So, uh, so I, I have a rather broad interest in just history uh, and archaeology. Of course, archaeology is history. Um, and geology, earth history, that's history. <laughs> I, I took uh, a couple of courses in geo geology and uh, uh, Baylor because I had to have a couple of science courses and they were just right down my line because I was learning about the history of land which uh, is also fascinating. Any particular preference in archaeology? Oh, biblical archaeology is, is fascinating but, but uh, I've, uh, I've gone arrowhead hunting too. <laughs> I took a course when I was here from Harold Leibowitz. Sure. In biblical archaeology. Is that One of the right? best courses I ever took. Oh, yeah. That's fascinating. Well, I get a, a monthly magazine, Biblical, Arche biblical Archaeology Review, I believe is the name of it, and it has some wonderful stories in it. All right. Of American history, what's your favorite period? Well, I think the Civil War, although, you know, <laughs> I will, I'll be reading some, something about the Revolutionary War and, 
and I will become fascinated on that. And then, well, I have a lot of books here about Abraham Lincoln, and uh, how that was. Of course, the fact that he was assassinated, and well, the whole thing about Lincoln is very, very interesting. So, I probably have more Lincoln books than anything. Oh, I'm. I'm quite a bit of a genealogist. Well, so I, I take it back that way. I have uh, I have been fascinated by genealogy too because and and I I like to explain it to my family is that I'm not trying to prove anything about the family, but I think my children and my grandchildren need to be aware of their heritage. If kids don't know where they're from, it, I think they, it should be a source of pride. Yeah. Not, not that they were, had any special thing about, about them, but, but who they are. They need to be identifying as who they are. You see behind me a picture here of my third great-grandfather, who was a uh, member of Congress from 1797 to 1816. Well, I didn't know that until I started doing some genealogy. And I and this was after my daddy had died. I feel sure that because we talked about my grandfather, the, the Confederate, and his experiences in the Civil War, that daddy would have told me about that. But I think I, I discovered that on my own, I guess, but uh, when I found I found that out and, and doing the genealogy, I found, uh, found found that he had succeeded in Congress. His father-in-law, who was my third great-grandfather, no, oh, who was my second, I guess. I'm confused at the moment about it, but but he was uh, a member of the third Congress that met in Philadelphia, and you see below that picture there, hanging a printed sheet of paper that's called a broadside. Now that broadside is campaign literature for my third great-grandfather, oh. and it, it's dated 18 and 8. I found it on the internet. So that showed up on the internet. I had to have that. Imagine 18 and 8, and it was about his campaign. And of course, then, of course, now we print out brochures and circulars and things, have lots of them. But uh, this told his whole, whole campaign, what, all, that he, all he stood for, and everything that would justify his election. Is that a Hightower surname? Uh, no, that, well, yes, it is through, through my father's family, but uh, his name was Richard Stanford, and uh, his, he is my grandmother, my daddy's mother's ancestor. Now, do you have any uh, ancestry traced back to the Revolution? Yes, that, that's 1797, see, so when he, uh, and then the one that um, um, his father, that served in the third congress his father was a brigadier general in the in the uh, north carolina volunteers oh no <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and i i am a member of the uh, sar sons of the american revolution through him i haven't gone there yet but i've got uh, my well, fifth the, great grandfather you, served in the north well he served in the uh, Virginia militia. Sure. And then on the other side, I've got one that was with the North Carolina Volunteers. Well, my, my grandfather, my great grand, no, my grandfather uh, served in the Louisiana, uh, Second Louisiana Regiment, and went to Northern Virginia and fought uh, the whole war on, with with Lee. Uh, in the Army of Northern Virginia. Then came back to Louisiana. Well, he was 
one of several boys, and uh, he he stayed in Louisiana a little while and then came to Texas. His um, his father had given each one of the boys a thousand dollars or a slave when they got to be twenty one. Well, he took the thousand dollars, but then went off the army, <laughs> and uh, and of course he didn't have any money when he came back. But uh, it, whatever money he had was in Confederate. I wish I had some of it right now. Have you so, ever gone to the Bureau of Land Management website and looked for land grants in your family? Oh yes, I my my grandfather has a, got a land grant out in the corner of Hall and Donnelly counties. Up there in the Panhandle, I and that's that. that's where where my daddy, where where grandfather brought my grandmother and and two or three children in 1890. Daddy was born in 1881, and they lived in well Stevens County, Breckenridge first, and mm -hmm. then they, they went to Quanah, then on up to uh, west of Memphis. And that's where he got his, his uh, land grant. Now, were any of them paid in land grants for service during the Revolutionary War? Not that I'm aware of. That's um, the Bureau of Land Management site. I found one in my family that got a copy signed by John Adams paying um, well, that's great. Captain William Fawn with 300 acres in what's now um, central Ohio. I wish it hung on to it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I have some a big bunch of land grants, that, uh, Texas land grants, um, in my collection. But um, the, the land grants, uh, well, I, I'm not sure we want to, we really want to know what all they, they did have. <laughs> all right. How much of uh all this reading, how much of that played into your um, into your career? Well, I majored in I majored in history before I got my law degree, so I, I have a a BA and an LLB, and I, my LLB major was in history. I mean, my law my BA major was in history. Um, I I have people come in here. And say, well, have you read all these books? <laughs> and I, my standard answer is, well, I'm a lawyer. You don't go into a lawyer's office and say, have you read all these books? But I know what's in them, and that's the important part. And I, it's so much fun to ha have an idea of well, what about such and such to know where you can go and find the answer. Was there something about your interest in history that pushed you towards studying law? Well, I think so. I think so. Because, really, law is history. It is history because um, the evolution of our legal system is fascinating. When I was on the Supreme Court of Texas, I discovered around in the court quarters several artifacts. Well, there is no organization really collecting historical artifacts for this Texas judicial system. I have been a member of the U.S. Supreme Court Historical Society for years because I was interested in that. So I solicited um, Judge Jack Pope and uh, other members of the Supreme Supreme Court, and to uh, uh, organize a Supreme Court Historical Society. And on the 150th anniversary of the organization of the Supreme Court of Texas, we got a 501c3 charter from the Secretary of State for the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society. And I was uh, president of it for seven or eight years. We'd have a banquet every year 
and try to raise money to operate. Well, of course, um, it seemed that no one else was really trying to get involved, so I told them to get a new president. I didn't want it to be just Hightower's Supreme Court Historic Society. And so um, we, we elected other, others in line, and, and uh, fortunately it is, has grown. We have a large $150 or $200 a plate banquet every year to raise money for the operation. And we have a full-time staff. And so what's that collection like? Well, it's, it's, it's not uh, so much a collection as it, it's a, an organization that, well, right now they have uh, got a group of lawyers and historians writing a history of the Texas Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. In a two-volume thing, it'll come out in a couple of years, I think. And uh, what type of artifacts did you run across? Well, uh, letters uh, and other other things that were used by the court. They have a, up in the Supreme Court building. The uh, you go in that Tom Clark building. There are some cases there that show some things. Now, was somebody just actually archiving those, or did well, they? Well, we have we have collected them. Mm -hmm. We've got people to give things. Oh, all right. Good deal. So uh, when did you get your law degree? In 1951. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in, um, in May 51. And what was your particular interest in, in law? What field? Well, I, I grew up in um, a little town of Memphis in the southeast corner of the Panhandle. My wife uh, grew up in Tulia, which is between Amarillo and, and Lubbock. And we had married about six months before I got out of law school. I wanted to go back to West Texas to practice law, but there wasn't an opportunity in Memphis, nor was there an opportunity in, in uh, Tulia. So uh, I liked the little town of Vernon. It, um, it was a little larger than both of those towns, and it was um, an oil town as well as an agriculture, rich agriculture area, but it's also the headquarters of the Wagoner Estate, which is the largest um, ranch in Texas under one fence. King Ranch is a bunch of different ranches over in South Texas, all together as a King Ranch, but they have over a half million acres under one fence, <laughs> well, under a fence. It's all all adjoining. <laughs> um, the um, manager of the Wagner Estate at that time was a man named Robert B. Anderson, and Anderson later became Secretary of the Navy under Eisenhower, and then um, uh, Secretary. Well. And then later on he was Secretary of Defense under Eisenhower. So, um, of course that was an inducement for that kind of crowd to be around there. So what led you into the public service end of it? Well, I had always wanted to be involved. So when I, I moved to Vernon and June of 51. Well, the elections of 52 were, would be coming along. So, I, the man that was a member of the legislature from that district, decided not to run. So, there was a vacancy, and I ran. Well, there wasn't anybody else interested in the job because it paid $10 a day for the first 120 days and $5 thereafter. Well, who, <laughs> who would want that? that's still the current pay scale. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, my wife couldn't understand it either. 
because she was teaching school and uh, and then here I am trying to traipse off to Austin. But at that time she was pregnant and Ann, our oldest daughter, was born the 7th of January. Legislature convened on the 13th or 14th, I think. So at, I came down here, got sworn in, went home, got Colleen and Ann, brought them down here. And for that first session, well, we lived in a little apartment over here on Rio Grande in a home that had been the home of Governor Sayers. But we had an upstairs apartment in that old house. And then when the legislature was over, we went back home. I made $25, I think, the first uh, month I was home. Well, with a wife and a child and house payments, that's not going to cut it. So I went to Fort Worth and walked into a law office and uh, got a job that would pay about $400 a month. And we went to Fort Worth, but I wasn't going to stay there. I knew, I hadn't been there two weeks until I knew that that wasn't for me. So at the end of the year, I went back to Vernon and became a partner with Leon Douglas. Leon was district attorney. And um, so he offered me a job and wow, we were glad to have it and go back to Vernon. And, but I hadn't, we hadn't been there any time hardly until he was appointed on the, to the as prosecuting attorney with the Court of Criminal Appeals down here. He called, called me and said, if you want this job, you better get after it because I'm going to resign. So I, I called, I called uh, several people here in, in Austin. I called the state senator. <laughs> I called two or three people that had the had Governor Shivers here. And of course, Governor Shivers knew me because of the session that I had, had served. I had been, I'd supported his program. So by two o'clock that afternoon, I was appointed um, district attorney, effective 1st of January of 54. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, first, fit, well, no, that was 54, 1st of January of 55. So then I served um, seven years. I mean, I have to think about it a little bit, but anyway, I, I served. Uh, no, I, anyway, that I served uh, as district attorney, and about the about that time, uh, Frank Eichert, who was a, the uh, congressman from uh, our district, resigned, and they looked like an opportunity for. Or promotion, so I ran, but I got beat. So I came back home and uh, and bided my time until I had a chance to run for the Senate. I ran for the Senate and was elected. Was it always your preference to practice criminal law as opposed to something more lucrative no. like oil and gas law? No, no, really. Um, there in in a small town like uh, Vernon, uh, you. Uh, you did whatever came in the door. I would think that probably would have been more oil and gas than criminal. No, no, you, you people have divorces and 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 have write wills and die and all that, all the whole spectrum of the practice of law in a small town. I would definitely think family law is probably the most hazardous. Yes. <laughs> Well, it's it's not as much fun. Yeah. I understand you served in the Navy. Served a couple of years in the Navy. Um, I was um, 17. Um, no, I was 18 on September the 6th, 19. Um, Turn it off for a minute. I, I've got to get. And he can edit out. I was going to be 18 on 
September the 6th of 1944. Well, I didn't want to be drafted, so I joined the Navy on September the 2nd, 1944. The war was over on September 2nd, 1945, just took me a year. <laughs> and then I was in several more months, maybe about two years. Didn't, didn't want to make it a career, become a JAG officer? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I was more, I was, well see that was before I went to law school, so I was anxious to get out and go to law school. Where did you go to law school at? Baylor. Oh, the, okay. uh, <clears throat> when you're, when you come up for discharge, are you, are you a veteran? No. Well, when you come up for discharge, they really try to make you sign up for the reserves. Well, I knew I wanted to go to law school. And there wasn't any point in me signing up in the reserves as an enlisted man when I could go to law school and get a commission. And so that's what I thought I'd do. But a funny thing happened before I got out of law school. The Korean War broke out. And if I had joined the reserves, I would have been in Tokyo the next day. And so. So I, I missed it at that point. Now, what's your perspective on World War II? I've, I've been really listening to the Ken Burns. I've been watching that. Too. Isn't that great? It yeah. really is great. Yeah, all my family back to the revolution has been military. Oh, yeah. Had an uncle jump over Normandy on D Day. Oh, a, my. Yeah. Another one lost over New Guinea in 43 that didn't get back to the States until 89, when his plane was found. Oh my, my. And um, then an uncle in Korea, my dad was in Vietnam. And, um, you know, I look at what's on the media today and I kind of disagree with the perspective of how that piece of history is being taught. I would say World War Two probably actually started about 1927 with the Japanese occupation oh, sure. in China. China. Sure, it did. But you know, there was a and politically we were isolationists. A lot of people, of course, World War One had been the war to end all wars. Well, it couldn't and didn't. But a lot of people were naive enough to think it it had. And they weren't about. So I, I think uh, Roosevelt did a magnificent job in bringing us up as much as we, as much as he could, as much as he could, until the Japs brought it to fruition. Do you think he had an idea that was coming? Oh sure. Mm -hmm. I don't think he had an idea that Pearl Harbor was going to happen when it did, but I, I think he knew that. Uh, that Hitler or the Japs or somebody was going to try to bring in, because that was, it wasn't going to be enough for Hitler. Hitler wanted world domination. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, look at people's perspective on it today. I just don't think there's enough emphasis on history anymore. That's right. Well, I think the real problem uh, that's uh, in the um, in Near East right now, with Iraq and a lot of the Iran and started in the Treaty of Versailles because the, Germany and and um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire were at the mercy of the British and the French and the Americans, yet they kind of ignored the Ottoman Empire, which was crumbling, which crumbled, of course, and let, let that alone. And if they had showed as much interest in writing a map of the Ottoman Empire, they would have had a Sunni state and a Shiite state, and they would, they would all have had separate states, and they would have had the same.
I, now that's just a crazy idea of mine, but I, I think it's probably has some element of truth in it. Uh, that sounds perfectly sane to me. Well, have you read um, Lawrence of Arabia? No, I haven't. The, uh, the um, Seven Pillars of Wisdom is a great book by Lawrence, and it tells all about the problems there at that time. Well, how does a civilization like that go from oh, uh, there? Well, they, they, they came, they saw, conquered all of northern Africa and got up and got to Spain and they were stopped in Spain. But there's still a lot of, of the Arab influence reflected in, in the things that exist in Spain. Well, over 800 years ago, they were the best astronomers, navigators, and mathematicians. Oh, what sure. happened to them today? Sure, sure. How'd they get to where they are now? Sure, well. Is that what, what's happening to us? Is that our future? Oh, my. Well, I have taken down my flag as far as being a predictor. I'm not a good predictor. Historian. Well, they just don't teach enough history. Nobody's got the opportunity to analyze it and learn from it. Sure. Well, shall we walk through it? Would you like to do that? Sure. Draft. It's been cut off of a, of a uh, document. I think that was a criminal act, but for so long, people were more interested in the in this actual signature than in the document. But uh, that is an authentic signature. I am Houston, Sam Houston. And then below it here is a document from the uh, U.S. House of Representatives dated February 18, 1837. And it says, resolved by the House of Representatives of the United States that the government, that the independence of the government of Texas ought to be recognized. 18 and 37. This is a land grant signed by David Vernon, the first um, president of the Republic of Texas, who didn't get along with Sam Houston. I just a print of the, you know, the Declaration of Independence of Texas. This is a replica of Sam Houston's gavel, and then a good picture of. Sam. Brick from the capital of Texas at Vern. I have seen one of those recently. <laughs> and this is a, a uh, pottery piece that says Texas Centennial. In, 19, in the summer of 1936, <coughs> when the Centennial Exposition was in Dallas, my daddy took me and my sister on the train to go down to see it, and that's our souvenir. And this is a stone from the Alamo. This um, print up here of the hung jury, I think is so amusing, but that print has been hanging in my office since the day I took the oath of office as an attorney. <laughs> <coughs> of old iron sides. USS Constitution that is, is in dock in Boston and several years ago I was in Boston for an event and they gave me that uh, picture so I brought it back here hang it on my wall below of which I have a piece of wood made into a gavel that's from the USS Constitution this is from the Constitution All right. These are old prints, one of them, the death of Jackson, and the death of Washington, and the death of Abraham Lincoln, death city. And not the rest of them. I would get hung up on that, but anyway, I have one three. These are gavels. I've lost a bunch of gavels, but 
course, I was, I was Grand Master of Masons in 72, got a lot of gavels, and then when you're, when you're in the legislature, you just get gavels. And this, this is out of stone, huh? Yeah, that's, I don't know, I, I don't know if it has a special history, I, and I don't recall even where I got it. I, I made a mistake of not putting a tag on things that were given to me, mm -hmm. but that mistake I can't do over again. <laughs> This is the oldest book I have in my collection. Sixteen forty seven. Readings of, of the famous lawyer Sir Robert Brooke. 1647, but it's signed by Roger Brooks Tawney, who was the Chief Justice that wrote the Dred Scott decision in 1860, he died in 1864, and of course Lincoln was president at the time. This, he was succeeded by Samuel Palmer Chase, who was Lincoln's Secretary of Treasury. Who then Lincoln put him on the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And here's Samuel P. Chase, History of the Federal Government, 1840. And these are these are Supreme Court judges. This, this is a, an interesting one. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Member of the court for many years. These are the by judges or by, about judges. And <clears throat> then I have several astronauts, and I call them this air and space area. But these are all astronauts. First man on the moon, first man on the moon, Werner, Werner von Braun, who uh, was the German that came over uh, after the uh, after the war and uh, was responsible basically for our space program. He was, he was the genius that, that made it possible for us to go to the moon. Okay, that's... When a book is of particular value, I like to put it in a box because the, one of the big dangers is fire, but not the fact that it might get burned, but the fact that water might ruin it. So you get additional protection if you put it in a box. And this one is Jonathan Swift, but it's signed by Robert Morris. Get it over here. Well, Robert Morris, who was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. This is Alexander H. Stevens, the Vice President of the Confederacy. This is Prescott Bush, Senator from Connecticut, who is the father of George H. W. Bush, the grandfather of George W. Bush. These are all U.S. Senators. These are U.S. Senators from Texas. John H. Reagan, 
one of the first senators from Texas. Andrew Jackson Houston, Sam Houston's youngest son. W. Leo Daniel appointed him to the Senate, and he died shortly thereafter. But uh, O'Daniel appointed him because he wasn't going to be running against him. O'Daniel wanted to go to the Senate and did. These are U.S. congressmen from Texas. Here's Jim Wright, Jake Pickle. Um, these are all cabinet officers, U.S. cabinet officers. Um, Cordell Hull was the Secretary of State for 12 years of the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration. Guide to Louisiana, a Confederate military unit. Yeah. Oh my lord. Here's the, these are Texas governors here. And the first one is presented to Lieutenant Governor M.M. M. Crane by O.M. Roberts, March 11th, 1893. I want to wait just one second. Where are the cookies? They're right here. I'll get them all. First things first. Yeah. That mm -hmm. sounds like a fire truck. Yeah. I hope it's not coming here. <laughs> We're going to be grabbing books. You know, that's right. Oh, my goodness. Look at those cookies. Yeah. And I, and I was over there while I was in Congress and admired it so and of course I wasn't asking for anything that didn't know didn't know the word were prints I might be available anyway when I got back to, to Washington while well, they had mailed me that uh, print. And this picture is of uh, Roosevelt and Churchill early on in the war in North Africa, Marrakesh. And this over here is a drawing by Sarah Churchill, his daughter, and it's signed and embossed by her. Uh, and that's probably at, uh, the last time they were together over in Yalta. Wow. But, um, and this I get a kick out of showing. Because this is Jack and Ann Richards and Betty and Phil. Of course, I didn't call her Betty, but uh, <laughs> Fantastic. who thought of that? I don't know. Amy, I guess I don't know. Amy took us all to the, took them all to the photographer. But then, I, w I like to show this. After I fell, this friend of mine had a burden to me that I'm so appropriate. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I hook. can identify with the hip thing. Society was Joe Greenhill and, and uh, Judge Pope and I were the three um, organizers of the society. And this is what they gave me uh, when I went out as president. signature that's cut off of a document. Is that the photograph of him? That, that's a photograph of Lincoln, but it's um, the, uh, I don't know what the document was, but some criminal cut it off of a document. Yeah. Now down here, is um, Winston Churchill. 
inscribed by Winston Churchill in 1949. <laughs> signed by Victoria, Queen Victoria. <laughs> Signed by Wally Windsor. Wallace Windsor, Edward's wife. I read Amer about scrapbooks that you made, one of Lincoln, one of Adams, I think, and then one of the one that you made before. Oh, well, obviously, when I was just really kidding. Young, did you keep them? Scrapped it. Well, they're trailer. They are? Yeah. Oh, they already have them. Oh, yeah. And let's see here. <coughs> this is Mary Lincoln, Lincoln's wife, 1864. This was in the White House Library, evidently, but I How did guess, you run across it? I, I, don't, I don't remember where I got it, but I bought it from somebody. and. Uh, uh, of course, when she left the White House, well, she took her things with her. Now, this is signed A. Lincoln, but this A. Lincoln is Lincoln's grandson. He had four four boys. One of them was already dead when when that drawing was made. Uh, Eddie died early, or Willie, and. Uh, uh, only Robert and, and Tad uh, survived their father, and then Tad died uh, as a young man. And so Robert had, he had two daughters and a son. The son was this A. Lincoln. So there are no Lincoln descendants. Oh, wow. That's just about it. <laughs>